Thank you. So, so tonight we've learned that there's enormous variation in human societies. Different societies have different notions of what democracy is. They have different theories of how the body works. They have different sorts of constitutions. And I'd like to talk a little bit about how states and societies and people interact. That interaction also varies enormously across countries and in ways which we think have enormous consequences for people's well-being. In particular, I'm interested in the kind of nexus between effective states, the prevalence of rule violations in society. We tend to think that effective states are good at eliminating rule violations, and people's intrinsic willingness to be honest, their intrinsic honesty. Now, this also varies a lot across countries, and it's a relationship that's been interpreted in a particular way by the social scientists and social theorists who've thought about it. On the horizontal axis here, I have a measure of the prevalence of rule violations in different societies. You could think of that as the effectiveness of the state in enforcing the rule of law, eliminating corruption. On the vertical axis, I have a measure of the extent to which or the proportion of people in different countries that are intrinsically honest as measured by uh, data for an experimental game. I'm going to describe that game in more detail in a little bit. But for the moment, just think of that as people's intrinsic honesty. So you can see, if you look at the picture, that in countries which have effective states, they're very good at stopping rule violations. Sweden, UK, Netherlands, Germany. There's a much higher proportion of people that are intrinsically honest. Whereas in countries like Tanzania or Georgia, for example, where the states are much good, at, sorry, the state is much less good at enforcing rules and preventing rule violations, people tend to be much less intrinsically honest. Now, the people who've thought about this relationship, such as the sociologist Norbert Elias or the philosopher Michel Foucault, have tended to assume that its effective states create a different sort of people. They create intrinsically honest people. You have a state that enforces the rules, people adapt to that, people internalize the rules, people become intrinsically honest. But you know, looking at that data, there's no reason why you, could read, you have to read it like that. It could be that you know, people in different societies have different sorts of social norms, different sorts of values, and intrinsically honest people are just better able at creating effective state authority. So I'm a social scientist. You know, how do you cut through the sort of Gordian knot of causality here and know what's really causing what? Well, the way you do that is with a natural experiment. So I've been studying a natural experiment uh, in the Congo Basin in Central Africa, and it's to do with the migration of the southern Mongo people. So in the medieval period, the southern Mongo people migrated from uh, the river Congo, which is up here, or the river, Kasa uh, the river Congo, yeah, the river Zaire, as it was known when this map was drawn by the historian Jan van Sina, they migrated, ooh, sorry, terrible. They migrated into the savannah around the confluence of the Sankuru and Kasai rivers. So they came with a common oral history, a common language. They all had a lineage. They claimed to be the descendants of a mythical founder called Woot. And some of them spread out to the west side of the Kasai River, and some of them spread out to the east side of the Kasai River. What's interesting about this is in the 17th century, to the east of the Kasai River, a process of state formation took place. A very effective centralized state emerged, the Kuba state. Here's the king of the Kuba in the 1940s, as featured in Life magazine. And you can see this is a serious monarch. He was a serious monarch running a serious state. There was a professional army, a professional police, a fiscal system, a very elaborate legal system with appellate courts. You could appeal, lawyers, the whole caboodle. On the other side, this is to the east of the Kasai River. To the west of the Kasai River, nothing like that happened. So here's people, common history, common culture, common language. They spread out across the African savanna, and some of them experienced this process of the creation of effective state. So we can use this as an experimental-like variation to test what's the impact of effective central authority on people's norms, on people's willingness to obey rules. Now, why, why do you care about that? Well, if I back up and think about the Congo, the country where this is now, the Democratic Republic of Congo, you can see this is a state which is not very effective. 
Here's the hospital in Mushenge, which is the capital of the Kuba Kingdom. You can see there's not many people in it. There's not many people in it because there's not many beds, and there's not many of anything, really. There's not much medicine. There's not many doctors. So the Congolese state is very bad at providing services. Here's a rural school. Uh, there's no books. Maybe there's teachers. If there are teachers, they haven't been paid. Here's a freeway, here's a Congolese freeway. You can see it's uh, like a mud track. They call this National Road Number One. Uh, you know, this is a sort of idyllic Congolese driving scene. If this was the rainy season, you, this road would be completely impassable. Okay, so here's a state which is very ineffective at doing the sorts of things we think states should do. And this is also a society where a lot of rule break breaking goes on. Okay, this is, a, this, is a, this is an informal roadblock I experienced in Kinshasa. This gentleman here with the AK-47 is a policeman who's thrown a barrier across the road to shake down anyone who comes past. So you have to give him you know, du sucre, as they say in the Congo, in order to get through on this road. So there's a lot of rule breaking that goes on. So we'd like to understand how do these things fit together. Okay, so, and we did this using this natural experiment of the creation of the Kuba Kingdom. Okay, so how did we measure intrinsic honesty or intrinsic willingness to obey rules? We did it in the following way. We put people in a room with a dice. Three sides are white and three sides are black. Here's how it goes. You have to think in your head a color, white or black. Let's say white. You roll the dice. If the dice comes up white, you take some money. If the, white, if the dice comes up black, you allocate some money to somebody else. Now you're in this room, only you know what you thought in your head. There's a rule. You're supposed to stick to rules, right? But if you violate the rule, you get the money. So there's nothing that stops you just pretending you win every single time and you take all the money, okay? That's not what people do, it turns out, but there's nothing that stops you doing that. There's a lot of variation across this. What we were interested, across people, across societies in this. What we were interested in doing, and this is basically the information I showed you to start with, in Germany, they think white, it comes up white, they get the money. If it comes up black, the Germans don't do that sort of thing. Okay, so, 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 so what's, what's the hypothesis here? What's the hypothesis we learned from the work of Norbert Elias or Michel Foucault? The hypothesis is that the Cuba had this effective state, judicial system, appellate courts, that Cuba people should be much more reticent to break the rules. Now, we don't know what's in people's minds when they play this game, but here statistics comes to our help. In the game, they have 3,000 Congolese francs to allocate. It's about $3. You should be right half the time, okay? Which means that you should know, we should know that you should be giving about 1,500 Congolese francs to this other person you're playing against. The details of that are not so important. Now, so if everyone was being honest, these column, these bars here should all be up at 1,500 Congolese francs. So they're all way below, so everyone's cheating a bit, you know, everyone's cheating a bit. But what's interesting about this is the Kuba are cheating more. The brown bars here are how much the Kuba leave on the table for the other person. The gray bars are the average of all the other ethnicities we played with. So contrary to the hypothesis, the Kuba cheat more. They're less intrinsically honest. And maybe that's not so strange. Maybe if you have a state with effective institutions, effective legal institutions, you don't really need people to be intrinsically honest anymore because the state does it for you, okay? But why is that interesting? Why is that finding important? Well, go back to the Congolese state. People in the international community spend a lot of time talking about state building. We need to have state building. We need to promote state building. But no one talks about society building. If this finding is of general interest, then that first picture I showed you suggests that it wasn't effective European states that created law-abiding Germans. It might have been rule obeying Germans that were able to create effective central authority. And I think that's an important lesson for thinking about how you move a country like the Democratic Republic of Congo out of where it is now to something different. Thank you. <laughs>